Hello, uh, my name is Victoria Rymel. I'm Professor of Latin at Warwick and I direct the joint degree in Classics and English as well as our new MA in Ancient Literature and Thought. My research is focused on Imperial Latin literature and much of my published work has to do with intersubjectivity, desire and vulnerability. So it's with these themes of my own research in mind that I'd like to talk to you today about one very expansive word and concept in Latin and in the Roman world, and that's amor. Now, this isn't a talk that presumes or asks for any knowledge of Latin, but I do want to introduce that word amor without immediately translating it. And that's because I want to address head on the, the problem and the stimulus of untranslatability. We make sense of the world in large part through language and language shapes and transforms every bodily, uh, emotional and cognitive experience. As Duncan Kennedy puts it in his book, uh, The Arts of Love, the production of meaning is a social experience. The meanings of words are affirmed and challenged in every utterance. And this protest process of contestation is itself part of the meaning of language in use. So when we give that standard translation of amor as love, a kind of metamorphosis takes place. Bits are missed, others are remolded, and a whole different history of a concept is laid on top. So if you are studying um, writers like Sappho, Plato, Ovid and Seneca for the classical civilization love and relationships module, you might start by wondering about that word love in the title. Especially as clearly what you're often reading and learning about is perhaps best described not as love as, but as desire. Uh, eros in Greek, amor in Latin, at least desire might be another way of translating that word amor. Uh, passion is another um, translation, um, longing another one again. Amor like love in English might be a feeling, it might be an abstract thing or a person, um, a beloved as in my love, and in Latin, depending on whether it's marked in text with a small a or a capital A, and modern editors have to decide this, um, Amor, like Eros, can also be a god, otherwise known as Cupid in Latin. So it's worth um, pausing, and if you're watching this in a, in a classroom, you, you could stop the video uh, now, pause the video now, to reflect on what's at stake in translating amor as the English love rather than as desire. And how do we use those two words differently in English? Um, think also what's, about what's at stake in, um, say, describing Sappho's or Ovid's um, poetry, uh, elegy of Sappho's uh, verse or Ovid's Amores or Herodes, for example, his elegiac verse as love poetry. Um, so we're reminded here um, that if we go back quickly to this slide, that um, love, uh, love as in Amores in the plural um, also uh, stands for collection of poetry about Amor, because this was the title apparently of a famous collection of po poems by Cornelius Gallus, Rome's so-called first love elegist, to whom Ovid then pays homage in his um, debut collection of um, elegiac verse called The Amores also. So amor and the plural amores are master terms of Roman love elegy, or should I say erotic elegy, in more ways than one. It's also worth saying that although you might have the impression that amor or eros are, are kind of niche topics that belong only to particular first person genres, um, philosophical writing, of course, and what we call in question marks love poetry, that's only partly true. Um, Epic, tragedy, comedy are also all about the problem of desire. And um, the orator and the amato or lover are um, 
both masters of the art of seduction and of persuasion. They're both experts in body language, experts in performing gen gender. And when we look at the uh, phenomenological language of desire in Greek and Latin, describing desire as a, um, a, as a disease or a bite or a burn or a virus, that language takes us from medical, rhetorical and philosophical texts to, of all kinds, um, to elegy, of course, um, but also epic, tragedy, comedy, lyric, uh, pastoral poetry, satire, uh, verse epistles, and other genres like ancient prose fiction, for example, so-called ancient novel. Amor is an art um, or a, a skill that can be fostered, but it's also an uncontrollable emotion or thing we catch from others. It's soft and it's violent. It's the law and it's also above or beyond all laws. So when, um, for example, Ovid uh, in Amores 1-1 uh, depicts Cupid as a kind of ruthless imperialist, is it true, um, Amor, that everything everywhere is yours? He captures something of the huge expansiveness of this concept and experience in, in ancient thought. Okay, so thinking about that question then, um, what's at stake in translating Amor as love um, as opposed to translating it as desire? Well, there's a number of things to say perhaps. So love, uh, um, in English is, is more capacious as a, as a term, perhaps. Um, there can be a love of wisdom, a love of, of, of cake, a uh, love of uh, a person or love of equality in a person. Amor, like love, can refer to all kinds of human relationships and it's a subjective as well as a generalizable experience. It means different things to different people. So uh, remember or, or look up on Google Prince Charles in, in the infamously awkward Diana engagement interview uh, back in the early 80s when he muttered in response to the question, are you in love? Whatever love in love means. Um, Diana, of course, gave her own bitter response to this in her interview with, with Martin Bashir, which has been back in the press um, this month, when she said, well, you know, there were three people in, in my marriage, as if to say, well, that's what love meant to him. Um, and with love uh, in English and with, uh, as with the Latin amor, we find ourselves um, divided, as it were, between the who and the what. Um, do you love someone or something about them? Or do you love a thing generally? Now, how contingent or conditional is love? Um, how more love, love of, can be a declaration, it can be a state of affairs, um, it can be an abstract statement. But as soon as we speak of desire, as soon as we understand amor as desire, we are imagining a reaching out towards another person or thing. All of a sudden, the nature of being is, is put into question. There's a longing, a dependency, a, a need that can only be pursued or fulfilled in relation. To declare myself a lover of wisdom, I don't necessarily have to think about um, human relation or the boundaries of my own self. But if I am madly in love, if I turn love into a verb and begin to love or fall out of love or imagine losing the person I love, then my being in relation is a process that is taking place and unfolding. In other words, something is happening to me in interaction with others and with the world. So the the writers who explore Amor and Eros in, in Greek and Latin are deeply interested in precisely these issues as philosophical, poetic and human questions. As a philosophical interrogation, Prince Charles's infamous, you know, whatever in love means, has a long history that first takes shape for classicists with Plato. Um, Plato 
relegates bodily desire, the pursuit of sensual, sexual pleasure, to a realm far below the um, higher order of, of soul love, the soul love that has to do with the pursuit of, of virtue, of wisdom, and projects a highly gendered self-sufficiency. Desire, which is by definition desire for someone or something, puts that self-sufficiently sufficiency, puts that mind-body dualism into question. So in Roman cultural terms in particular, it threatens to make that self-sufficient implicitly free male subject less than free and less than properly masculine. That is more uh, female, in inverted commas, more feminine, more slavish, uh, more infantile. So what's interesting about Roman uh, um, erotic elegy or, or love elegy, uh, and also about Roman Stoic thought, especially as performed by Seneca the Younger, is that it situates itself on the edge of that threat to a certain kind of subject, to a certain kind of personhood. And in texts like Ovid's Amoris, uh, Seneca's Letters, the scene of literature, so it, the, the writing, reading and performance and reception of literature is itself part of that edge of exploration. In other words, these texts talk about interacting with them as a relational exercise that puts a spotlight on the reader's vulnerability to the text um, as something that can have an impact, produce an experience or take us out of our comfort zone in some way. So they think about uh, and, and often put on display how writing and song can, for example, seduce, trigger, implicate, persuade, or lure you into a particular perspective. So it's perhaps um, worth pausing the video again at, at this point to reflect how you feel about literary texts or, or art generally. So what preconceptions you have about that experience. Um, so you might, for example, take for granted that um, a film or TV drama or thriller might immerse you in a different world, might make you think differently, might allow you to step into somebody else's shoes, might traumatize you, shock you, move you to tears, etc., etc. And you might think that there's a gulf between the kinds of art uh, artworks you consume for, for entertainment, for your own pleasure, from the kind of art you have to analyse and know about and study in academic work. So why is that? What, what, what assumptions does that make? Okay, so in the next part of this video, um, I'm going to take a little bit of a look at what two writers of desire um, from first century Rome, um, Ovid and Seneca, have to tell you about what that reading encounter is actually like. So I'll start with Ovid. Um, and one of the most striking things about Ovid as a poet of desire is that he makes reading and writing about Amor inseparable from being a lover, from experiencing desire and relationships. So, for example, Ovid's lovers uh, seduce each other by writing letters um, and singing love poems, um, by writing love messages on, on dinner tables. The Ovidian lover must be a writer, uh, a lawyer, a rhetorician. Um, he and she must learn from reading love poetry and also be a close reader of texts and of body language. And what's more, Ovid but brings his audience into this drama. So on this slide, um, Amores 1-5, this is the end of, of that poem, um, an example of this where the poet, poet lover, uh, winks to his implicitly male readership uh, when he's writing of um, what happened between him and his girlfriend Corinna one, one lazy afternoon. And he says, why should I give all the details? Who doesn't know the rest? You know, we have to fill in the gaps and use our imagination. Um, or in the next passage you see here um, his Remedia Amoris, the sequel as it were to his Ars Amatoria, he even demands the kind of audience who can infer more, uh, who can read between the lines. Uh, when he's 
uh, perhaps occasionally hesitant to spell it out. Much of this, he says, indeed, it shames me to speak, but with your wit, imagine more than my words say. The texts in this, um, in this world of erotic elegy and in the adjacent wor worlds of new comedy and tragedy can wield immense power. Phaedra, for example, who is madly in lust with her stepson Hippolytus, famously sends her husband Theseus uh, a letter accusing Hippolytus falsely of seducing her uh, in order to absolve herself. And as a result, Theseus uh, sends his son to his death. Ovid's Heroides IV, uh, which is a new letter written in the voice of Phaedra to Hippolytus, intervenes in this myth by getting Phaedra to confess her animal lust for Hippolytus in writing, in, in the letter itself. So she begins, this is the start of Herodes IV, the Cretan girl who lacks health unless he grants it her, wishes good health to the man who's an Amazon's son, to Hippolytus. Read what is here. How could reading a letter harm you? There might even be something in it that pleases you. Phaedra's opening words in this epistle hold an almost visceral potentiality for us as readers. Phaedra, invaded by the force of Amor, speaking her desire, yet written over by the male poet, launching into a letter that, if found, will be the smoking gun that turns this myth violently around but that also has the power to implicate and harm its readers in the present. All letters, we are reminded, ask for a reply, uh, or, you know, in Ovid, they, they often already imagine a reply. And our reading of this text is inevitably a kind of writing back to Phaedra. Now, the idea that um, reading a letter might cause harm is made even more explicit later on in this same collection in the so-called double Herodes, and especially in the story dramatized in uh, Herodes 20 to 21, where a Contius uh, entraps um, a, a, a girl, Kidipi, by getting her to pick up an apple with the words, I promise by Artemis that I will marry a Contius carved into it. So she picks up this apple and once she reads it aloud, she's afflicted with a kind of disease, a kind of, um, a kind of amor that can only be cured if she, as it were, fulfills the contract and marries Acontius. So let's look at the start of Kidipi's letter of reply to Acontius. So Herodes 20 is Acontius' letter and this is her reply. I was fearful and read your text, your letter, without a murmur, lest my tongue knowingly swore by some god. And I think you might have set out to trap me again, except that, as you confess yourself, you know one promise is enough for me. I wouldn't have read it, but if I'd been harsh to you, perhaps it might have increased the fierce goddess's anger. Again, there's something hyper-intensive about this beginning. Um, story about the legalistic power of a written text that is being restaged in a letter, in an elegiac letter. A Kidipi in Ovid's hands is now a writer, she's not just a trapped reader of, of the apple oath. Yet this poem poses this sh the shift of position as a question for, for Ovid's audiences. So do readers, like writers, have the agency to transform texts as they interpret them? Or to put it another way, and I'm thinking here of the possible dialogue between Herodes IV and Herodes XXI, to what extent are we trapped by the cultural weight of stories, um, sometimes without even realising it? Do the stories of antiquity write us? or do we get to write them? And, and who decides the answer to that question? Now, Herodes 20 and 21 also pose important questions about consent that, that might really resonate for you now. 
you know, questions like, what is it to give consent to a relationship uh, verbally? Can consent be forced or bought? What is it to inhabit the kind of body that has desire inflicted on it? Are we repelled, shocked by Kidipi's entrapment? Or um, are we somehow turned on by it? And, and what is it like to try to answer that question? So the notion that someone can be um, read to death, which is almost what happens to Kidipi, um, culminates really in Ovid's relegation by the Emperor Augustus to the Black Sea in around 8 AD, apparently as a result of the crime, as he calls it, of his erotic poetry. So as a, as a follow-up to, to this video, you, you might read um, Tristia II, um, which is again a, a letter sent um, by Ovid to Augustus, ostensibly, in which Ovid uh, really ups the ante and blames all the guilt, all the harm that his, his um, love poetry can do on readers and their impure or guilty minds. We might also like to read um, Amores 2.7 and 2.8, which is a, a two-scene drama in which the, the reader's complicity, the reader's um, role in, in making a call, making a judgment um, is, is lit up for, for all to see. These are also very interesting poems, by the way, in terms of um, consent and the question of who gets to desire in the first place, who, whose desire gets seen in Latin poetry. So very um, quickly, finally, um, a brief word on, on Seneca, who, um, Seneca the Younger, who after Ovid, um, writes himself to death under a different emperor, uh, not Augustus, but Nero, in his collection of philosophical letters. Now, Ovid and Seneca are, I want to say, much less opposed as writers of desire than, uh, than it's often assumed. That is, it's not straightforwardly the case, I'd, I'd want to say, that Ovid um, and the elegiac poets immerse us in provocatively unvirtuous passions, while Seneca as a Roman Stoic is all about the rational control of uh, emotions. Um, it's not quite uh, that straightforward. Seneca is writing the epistles in political exile in old age in the early 60s AD, in the years leading up to his fourth suicide. And he's concerned both in the content of what he is saying and most importantly in the modality of performing that content with the problem of desire. And that he recognizes is a problem that, that is about um, uh, the difficulty of tolerating vulnerability in relation. So it's crucial really that this massive culminating philosophical work uh, that Seneca writes is a collection of letters because letters are texts that track and create a relationship. They uh, mark and, and explore a, a, a being in time with another person. And so um, their very form sets the scene for what is the, the problem of desire for the Roman man. So I just want to leave you by way of stimulus with a passage from Seneca letter 49, um, in which Seneca writes to his um, interlocutor, slightly younger man, Lucilius, about loss and longing. And what's really striking about this um, opening section of the letter is that um, Seneca performs not this, um, you know, dispassionate uh, voice of the uh, self-controlled, self-sufficient Stoic, but a role that's really reminiscent of Ovid's abandoned heroines, writing their letters from lonely shorelines across the Mediterranean. So he, he begins by saying, by writing, now, lo and behold, Camp Campania, and especially Naples, and your beloved Pompeii. Um, 
they struck me when I viewed them with such a wonderfully fresh sense of longing for you. And, and the word he uses there is incredibile recens desiderium. You stand in full view before my eyes. I'm on the point of parting from you. I see you choking down your tears and resisting without success the emotions that well up at the very moment when you try to check them. I seem to have lost you but a moment ago. But what is not but a moment ago when one begins to, to use the memory? So notice the overflowing emotion, the marvelling at the excess of desire, this incredibile desiderium, uh, this longing that reaches out over time and space and tries to make the distant written letter present. And Seneca's window into intimacy has a literary intensity, not least in its evocation of Ovid's heroides. Yeah. The question, is, is how we respond to that intimacy and, and what it has to do with um, making philosophical progress in coping with the destabilizing force of desire. And that progress is, is to be made, it turns out, by the very process of confronting those hard questions. So, um, later on, this is my, my final slide, later on in um, letter 49, Seneca says to Lucilius, why do you torment yourself? Why do you lose, lose weight over uh, some problem which is in, it is more clever to scorn than to, to solve? When a soldier is undisturbed and traveling at his ease, he can hunt for trifles along his way, but when the enemy is closing in on the rear and a command is given to quicken the pace, necessity makes him throw away everything which he picked up in moments of peace and leisure. I have no time to investigate disputed inflections of words or to try my cunning upon them. And then he, he lapses into poetry and he quotes two lines from Virgil Aeneid 8. Behold the gathering clans, the fast shut gates, and weapons wetted, ready for war. So at first his message it, to Lysilius in prose seems highly pragmatic. You know, the message is on your journey through life, when things get serious, you can't be concerned with frivolity, you can't afford erotic emotions, such as Seneca himself put on display, you might think at the start of this very letter. Yet then he, he, he gives us this, this decontextualized quotation in this line and a half from Virgil and Aid 8. So line, it's uh, um, line 385 and the first line of 386 of Aid 8 is actually spoken by the goddess of love, Venus. And here she is pleading seductively with her husband, Vulcan, um, just after having breathed um, divine love into him with her words and I've quoted that um, uh, line just before um, this passage in an aid eight on that slide dictis divinum aspirat amorem so in other words um, amor is seeping poisonously into this text from elsewhere Seneca's desire is being channeled through Virgil and through Ovid, and it's provoking us into reacting. It's asking us for a reply. So I'm going to leave it there. My, um, the last slide is some follow-up bibliography.